So, es gibt keinen Grund, dass sie alle weglaufen. Ähm, wir bleiben nämlich zum Teil im Low-Tech-Bereich, der scheint äh, vielleicht nicht so viele anzusprechen. Ähm, wo ist mein nächster Redner? Da. Schweizerdeutsch und Englisch. Schweizerdeutsch und Englisch. Um, I think I switched to English as I'm speaking Schweizerdeutsch, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but maybe not all of you. So, um, but do you have technic? Uh, all working. Okay, so it is a pleasure to... Um, to hear something about working with uh, low-tech material, I would say. This? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So, um, I love the title of the next presentation, Smart Coconuts for Stupid Cities, and I'm Thanks. very excited what we're going to see and hear. Thanks. Um. Uh, Marc de Sellier. Uh, hello. I don't really know why I'm here today. But um, I will talk in English, although I would speak very fluent German with a strange accent. Um, but I want to talk in English because some of my friends are here. Maybe they're at their booth. Um, so about one and a half year ago, I met, I met Martin and Jenny many times, but we met again and we discussed, ah, these Germans with these robots, ah, I don't know. There's only a certain amount of robots Germany needs. Um, so we thought it would be really nice to, to include a more global aspect also for Make Munich. And we had this vision of the Bavarian foreign ministry giving us millions of money and we bring like half of the population of Asia here. It didn't work. Um, but I brought the coconut. And luckily we could manage that some of our, or my friends, from Nepal are here. They give a presentation right afterwards. They're called Karkana, which means factory. I think it's one of the most interesting maker education project worldwide that I have ever seen. Um, I also could somehow manage to get two of my Indonesian friends over from Yogyakarta. They're called Life Patch. And so that's why I'm talking English. Not because I don't want you to understand me, but I want, in fact, you to think about make about technology, about society, also outside of your common um, environment. That's also why I brought this. Anyone has seen this before? It's our planet Earth. What? Take it. What color does it have? Blue. Yes, exactly. Uh, we live on the planet Earth. I will show you lots of pictures from maps. I like maps a lot. So I'm from the Center for Alternative Coconut Research. I have stickers. I also have a booth. I didn't want one, but because I was somehow in organizing these things, they gave me a booth. Um, this is a coconut a friend of mine made. I hope he's going to come visit later the stage. So about a couple of years ago, we started with this. Um, putting Arduinos into coconuts. And that's also where we founded the Center for Alternative Coconut Research. Um, the sad truth is, there is pretty much nothing we can innovate about coconuts, because thousands of applications have already been done using coconuts, the nuts, the trees, um, and I will show you some examples. So it's the most futile research organizations because we truly believe that there is existing knowledge that solves all the problems we have. We just have to find this knowledge, implement it in the right way. And one way to bring knowledge from one place to another is by bringing the people from one place to the another and talking a common language, which usually is not German on the global scale. <laughs> um, cool, so let's talk about coconuts. Anybody has an idea what application of a coconut? Loud, you can drink the juice. What else? You can eat it. What else? Bones. Bowls, yeah. Eating bowls. What else? Musical instruments. What else? You can grow trees with it. Very good. <laughs> you can make more coconuts with a coconut. Anything else? 
I can't hear you. I come here, huh? You must know about coconuts. Where are you from? Uh, from India. Whereabouts? Uh, in the northeast Assam. Yeah, Northeastern Indian don't know anything about coconuts. <laughs> um, so, in fact, we founded the Center for Alternative Coconut Research on a beach in Goa. But first, I will tell you a bit who I am. Um, this is where I'm from. It's almost in Bavaria. It's in Switzerland, in Schaffhausen. This is this little piece of Switzerland that sticks into Germany. Uh, the Americans bombed it and because they thought it was Germany. It looks like Bavaria and we also hang around in the forest. And This is a Fab Lab, a Unteres Etzislo. It's the least equipped Fab Lab in the world. We have a laser pointer. Uh, we have precision milling, a uh, chainsaw, in fact. And we have solar powers and we have a hole in the forest. It's not some fancy whatever decomposing toilet. It's just a hole in the forest. It works. Um, I'm involved for now more than or about 10 years with the Swiss Mechatronic Art Society, the Schweizerische Gesellschaft für Mechatronische Kunst. This is our makerspace that we have now for about eight years. We focus a lot on DIY electronics, programming Arduinos, and a lot of etching PCBs, printed circuit boards. This is a very untypical image. It's usually much more messy. Um, about 10 years ago, I finished my PhD in nanotechnology and I started to get active in this Swiss Mechatronic Art Society. And suddenly I started to make these very simple electronic devices. I had no idea about electronics. I did not know what was plus and minus, but I was thrown at kids and had to teach them electronics, soldering and so forth, blinking LED stuff. So you can get a PhD at ETH in Zurich in engineering and you don't know what is plus and minus. <laughs> in my solar power in my house, plus is the black wire and minus is the red wire. Because minus I thought was a bit bad, so I put the red kind of warning color on that one. But then in the middle of the house I switched. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so the Swiss Mechatronic Art Society, we just celebrated our 10 years anniversary. Um, we did a few do-it-yourself festivals from 2005 to 2008, I think. And our roots are a community meetup on do-it-yourself, analog synthesizer geeks. And we still keep this musical thingy, so this is the same circuit as we saw before. But now it looks like this. Um, this Urs mate, who is also there with the cow fur. Um, but somehow... Back in the days, I started soldering, had no idea what I was doing. I got invited to China. I got invited, not really China, the Republic of China. Where is the Republic of China? It's called Taiwan sometimes. It's also called Formosa, which means paradise. <laughs> um, but then I also, on the same trip, met my Indonesian friends. And I went to a place called DIY. Dera Istimewa Jogjakarta. They have DIY police, DIY bank, and so forth. Um, but on these first tours in 2008 and 9, I was quite surprised that my academic career didn't bring me anywhere, but just soldering a few circuits, very simple circuits, you know, I get invited all over the world. And with these friends, especially Indonesians, we since then continue that joy of making very funny circuit. You see on the right side, a simple oscillator blinker sheet. Uh, we really like etching our own boards. That's why I have these holes in my, pocket, in my trousers. <laughs> and we did a big mistake about eight years ago. We started to sell out. We started to make this DIY makeaway workshops, the fast food of soldering. And I think it's the worst thing we have ever done to educate our people. Everybody started to invite us, ask, hey, we have half an hour, 40 kids, everybody solders, and then they learn about technology. I do think when you solder a circuit, you learn nothing except following a master's rule. And that's not really what I want to teach. So, but still, I do it all the time in India and blah, blah, blah. Um, it led us to another project in India, more on the biohackers. We're over there. But that's for another time, building scientific instruments, another time. Uh, yeah, yeah, stuff. This is like the other show for those people who missed our presentation yesterday. Some of us makers, we make laboratories for scientific investigations. Um, we're over there. But anyway, um, what is that? Where is the globe? What's wrong with that map? 
Nothing. Good. What do you say? What's wrong with the map? It's falsch rum. It's falsch rum. It's the other way around. Um, in fact, it's not. I can read the text Russian Federation. In fact, it's, I think, correct. No, it's not. As again, <laughs> it's round. <laughs> It is mathematically almost impossible to represent a three-dimensional area on a two-dimensional projection. But some German guy in the 15th century called Mercator, he managed. That's why what you see is always wrong. Africa is much bigger than you think. Here. Um, the way we represent the landmasses are distorted. The center of the world may be not Europe. In fact, it's Indonesia. <laughs> um, so at this beach in Goa, back in 2011, me and my friend Yashas were bored, so we brought our soldering tools and we put the... Is there a laser pointer? <sighs> yes. We put the USB into a coconut. Um, it is based on a pre-Arduino microcontroller environment that is called GNUSP, the GNU USB and we wanted to make a wave to MIDI converter. Again, we wanted to make a synthesizer that converts the wave from the beach into music. What to do? You take a coconut, nature's most perfectly developed tool that swims around in waves. And so we recorded the waves kind of with an accelerometer and we played it into our synthesizers and it plays a MIDI file. Ah, that's what we do. And, but then there was also When I got afraid, when I started to worry, like, maybe this is dangerous what we're doing, uh, I saw these signs, this one I got from the internet, um, that obviously more people die from a falling coconut than eaten by a shark. Um, so we started a few projects around these coconuts. When we were drinking these fermented coconut drinks also, <laughs> um, we thought it would be interesting to replace a lot of the smart technologies by the existing knowledge that these people already have. And the good thing about our organization is all our meetings have to be for inspiration, where we have direct access to fresh coconuts, which means tropical beaches. Um, so this is Urs and, and Brian. They're your typical Swiss-British guys that go to the tropics. And of course, we wanted to save the world. And they put the Arduino GPS sensor into a coconut, you know. I heard rumors that in other parts of the world, they have problems with water. Then we thought, oh, cool, then can we solve it with an Arduino? Um, I was really happy to be able to invite them to Indonesia, introduce them to my friend, and let them geek around with whatever technology they bought in the West. And they went to the river, and they, they looked at the coconut, and they saw maybe some realities of the river that they were not expecting. In fact, maybe you don't need to monitor the water quality in the river because it stinks. <laughs> so you know it, everybody knows that the rivers are kind of dirty. And my friends organize a lot of um, activities around the communities on the river. In fact, there's very little I think we can help with an Arduino in a coconut. The other thing, that's why we put it in a coconut, If you let downstream a free computer on a river, most probably someone will steal it. But we can hire a guy and make sure no one takes the coconut. But then, if we already have a guy, why not have him doing the measurements anyway? But it's complicated. And so we did measure the temperature of the river on this GPS data. Extremely useful information. Um, <laughs> um, what else did we do with coconuts? Um, someone mentioned musical instruments. Because I'm a geek with musical instruments, we thought we kind of recreate some of these musical instruments, like traditional way you can make little flutes or little ding, ding, ding with coconuts. But we wanted, of course, to do something with technology. Um, over a couple of months, I had the pleasure to work in a pedagogic research group in Srishti, Institute for Art, Design and Technology in Bangalore. Um, and we We had a few months with a bunch of master students where we tried to kind of rethink these maker education kits. We bought some of the science kits, the maker kits. We looked at them and thought, what can we really use? We talked to the local teachers, which they do already for 20 years. I just had the pleasure to join the group for a couple of weeks. And all we came up is we put a coconut in 
an Arduino into a coconut, which is pretty useless. Um, but we were looking at the Makey Makey as a very successful and I think also pleasurable, call it educational tool. And we thought, let's just make a, a cheaper version of it because it is $50. They came up with the idea at Shrishti 10 years ago. Maybe, maybe it went wrong. I don't know. Um, who knows the Makey Makey? <laughs> okay, a few people. So what it does, it, it, you kind of touch a banana, but you have to have a wire on your wrist, and it does something in your computer, play music, press space, make a photo, something like this. It's very interactive and easy accessible. Um, every Arduino, has the capacity to do capacitive sensing. Um, so you don't really need a special tool for capacitive sensing. There is libraries out there, and we rewrote some of the libraries um, that is a, using an analog input of your Arduino, and it kind of flips inside some capacitors and kind of pull up resistors a bit fast, and then it measures the voltage on the same pin again, and you kind of get a capacitive input. Capacitive input means when I touch it, it will detect something. Even when I'm close to it, I didn't bring it. So, but we thought that is a very interesting interactivity that we want to share, make a low cost version of it. But, and we experimented with it and we measured all the kind of sensor data values and we rewrote some libraries. We also thought we could maybe connect it to something else than a coconut. But it's Stings, huh? <laughs> Thorns. Uh, we tried cheese also. It seemed to work. <laughs> and we also converted these libraries to, be, to work with another microcontroller, which is the Atiny. What is the time, if I might ask? Otherwise, I talk forever. I talk forever. <laughs> Ten minutes left. Very good. Um, so we tried cheese and apples and all that stuff. We tried making music and having this capacitive sensing. And in fact, there was also where I rethought a bit my idea of low cost. Um, a lot of us, me included, we, we, we think low cost is cool. We have this low cost educational platform like Arduino. We can maybe save the world and put some sensors. Uh, so the Arduino is on the right side. It's a 16 megahertz microcontroller and 8 bit processor, it has a USB serial interface, it costs around 29, 15, maybe cheap ones for five, yes. On the left hand, like, so you see another computer, <clears throat> 260 megahertz, MP3 player, polymer, all that something, it's a phone. So you get low cost, means something very different than an Arduino. Just low cost is everything that is no cost, um, or it's close to no cost. We still thought, let's try this low-cost Arduino clones with our friends to have something that's around one or two dollars. Um, kind of the price of two or three coconuts. Coconut here is like three euros, two or three, uh, ten, yeah. And we did a lot of workshops in Indonesia using these microcontrollers. Um, but we also wanted to create boards that we can produce ourselves so my friends can make a bit of a business. They etch boards and sold the boards so the neighbors or the children do it. And so this is what a collaboration with LifePatch, my colleagues from Indonesia, um, making kind of a cheap Arduino clone. Materot also has it now in their series. Um, it has a bootloader that detects the Atiny as a USB device. And it can do capacitive sensing. Uh, how do we do these boards in Indonesia? Um, some of my friends they prefer to make their own PCBs, then order it from China, it gets stuck at customs. Maybe they have no credit card, so they can't do online orders. So we do it in our garden. And many, maybe some of you know how to make PCBs. We use light to transfer a design onto a pre-coated board. We use some chemicals, that's in the beer bottle here. Uh, we have quality control, but how can we make this stuff transparent? We need kind of a transparent mask, but we didn't have transparencies, nor was our printer any good quality. So we used normal paper and coconut oil. It makes every paper transparent and so forth. So this led to one project that we kind of developed quite far. It's called the Coco Makey. It's a kind of low cost clone for the Makey Makey. You plug it in your USB, it's detected as a, a keyboard, 
and when you touch the coconut, which you connect with one wire, it presses space. This is the circuit, so we do this kind of stuff. Um, different editions. I was interested to explore, and it didn't work. Can local geeks manufacture their own boards and sell it to the local schools? Uh, that was a bit the idea, so that I don't have to take care about logistics and manufacturing. I'm really bad at this business thing. Huh? Um, but talking with one of the mentors to the Coconut Project, Mr. Balagopalan from Kerala, um, he said, I just get my retired friends over, he's an engineer, and we just make a few hundred boards. It never happened. Um, but then my other friends from Switzerland, they make music and so forth. We make our bones, boards like this, like really small edge circuits, eh, lots of stuff. Other friends that were involved in this project, this Stahl from Zurich also, doing a lot of the coding work. Um, this guy was developing, or whatever, further developing an existing open source bootloader project for the Tiny. This is this guy here, Michi and Stahl. These are the people in, in, in India that helped a lot on also the design and the application in the educational context. This is the Art Science Bangalore um, department at Shristi. They experimented already making a kit with it, making a hand-drawn circuit, making a bit of merchandise and stickers and so forth. And so we're kind of here, but then, I don't know, this is the programmer from Indonesia that developed a lot of the hard-coded, hardware-based programming and all the Arduino integration and all the ASCII art that comes when you upload the code. He also further developed an existing kind of Arduino programming language in your browser to work with the Tiny and our bootloader. Yeah, and lots of stuff, so this was like, 10 years almost of coconut research from the earliest USB devices, open source USB devices like pre-Arduino um, to various different boards and experiments. But what happened, in fact, it, it's, it, yeah, no one has it, huh? <laughs> we did not manage this distributed manufacturing idea. I don't know why. It's kind of well documented. I think it's useful in education. Um, you don't even need the coconut. <laughs> um, does anybody has a question? We can talk about the technicalities of the bootloaders later, but... So, what we have investigated for five, six years is using these uh, tiny microcontrollers as a replacement for many other similar maker kits. They might work, they're relatively cheap, about one dollar, they're easy to make solder by hand, so you don't need advanced manufacturing uh, access like with the new 32-bit microcontrollers, it's a bit difficult. Um, you can use them as coconuts, or you can also make musical um, instruments and so forth. I'm still not so sure where we're heading, um, but just one thing that I want to briefly show you now is the most recent development. The problem we had is that people could not solder a USB connector. It's just hard. Um, the other problem was that we go to a school and they have a bunch of old computers around, but we don't have administrative rights. So when we plug in something, we can't install the drivers and all that stuff. So uh, a recent development together with one, he's also here from the Roboto Club Freiburg. Um, he developed a programming bootloader that listens to an audio signal. Audio signal is a wave. <laughs> Um, for those of you who remember how we talked to computers in the 80s with tapes, <laughs> modems, um, this is how computers talk. So he developed a bootloader that listens to a sound file that we can play from our computer and it is integrated in the Arduino IDE. So instead of USB, we started now to go into this audio programming. It's, I think, really powerful. I hope someone picks it up. I will not make any business with it because I'm really bad at... Um, we also developed lots of new tools to make these um, boards more attractive. And instead of me as a geek with my own style, it always looks this 8-bit style, we thought let's have all the other creative children or whoever develop their own boards for future soldering kits. So we developed the design tool um, to make designs for hardware. On the left side here you see a fish. Um, this one was made in Hamamatsu, in Japan. Um, it's also, uh, this specific application is for an R tiny board, like 
a blinker thing or a sound synthesizer or a thermometer or a coconut capacitive sensing tool. But I developed a little kit, pieces of paper that have the footprints from SMD components and we laminated it nicely and we cut it out and then the participants can try to learn reading the schematics and open source schematics so it's kind of well documented hardware, a bill of materials so they can reproduce the same hardware because I exactly say which part it is and where to buy it and they can then do what open hardware is all about. They can redesign the circuit for their own aesthetic needs for their own shape needs or further developments. And it works pretty well. I was super surprised. I just tried this a few weeks ago. Um, the diversity that comes out from such a circuit. It needs a few digital steps and you can get it. Um, this is like the parts. A few steps after you scan it again and you get either you print it, you scan it and etch it yourself you upload it and you can download it from some website that is called Kitnik, a sharing tool for kids. Or you can get it manufactured directly from Shenzhen. So my idea was to have more people kind of manufacturing a huge diversity of different kits that, yeah. So this is a bit the last part that I wanted to show. I have this thing here, but I will never be at the booth, so find me somewhere else. Um, so what did I say about coconuts? I don't know. <laughs> um, thanks also to the main programmers from Indonesia, Switzerland, and Nepal, and India, and Germany, and wherever. I think I did mention their names. Um, yeah, any questions? Hi. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I. Uh, learned a lot about coconuts and maybe nothing about coconuts. I'm not sure. Um, so, questions from the audience. Who has questions about coconuts or what, is, what does this do? Some different. Yeah, what is going to happen? I saw it looks like a little uh, rocket. I, don't I thought it will start. I don't, know. Uh -huh. I don't know if he's here, but this is a friend of mine brought. It's a, a tiny controlled. Lora Van Coconut. Maybe some of you know this Lora Van, low energy. I just found it on one of the other tables. Ah, okay. <laughs> so you don't know what's going on. Questions here? Nothing, yeah. You briefly mentioned the, the bootloader with audio. Uh, what's, where can I find more about that? Um, on my stickers. Um, so we developed the bootloader first for the 8-bit mixtape. So if you Google 8-bit mixtape, you will find the information. Um, we have also a GitHub repository that's linked from there. It's mainly been developed by this Christoph Haberer from Roboter Club Freiburg back eight years ago. And we just adapted it to the Artini. I think he's around. And so the bootloader itself is on his GitHub. And the mixtape is more than combining different applications of it. And it, I think it's really good. It's only 700 bytes. And we only have 8 kilobytes, so... Okay, if there's no urgent question, and I have to look on my Swiss watch. So, thank you very much again. And good luck. <laughs>